welcome everybody to the final day of our Koopman's lecture series about psychosocial oncology research and practice with Indigenous communities, unique issues and key considerations. We've had a couple of great sessions already and some really good discussion. I'm very much looking forward to continuing that today with our final uh, keynote speaker and panel. Let me just begin with a land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that what we call Alberta is the traditional and ancestral territory of many peoples presently subject to Treaty 6, 7, and 8, namely the Blackfoot Confederacy, Kainai, Pekani, and Siksika, the Cree, Dene, Salto, Nakota Sioux, Stony Nakota, and the Suksina Nation, and the Métis people of Alberta. We acknowledge the many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit who have lived in and cared for these lands for generations. We are grateful for the traditional knowledge keepers and elders who are still with us today and those who have gone before us. We make this acknowledgement as an act of reconciliation and gratitude to those whose territory we reside on or are visiting. Now, just again, a little bit of background of the Koopmans lectureship. Uh, a couple of days ago, we had Jan Koopmans give us a you know, sort of lively uh, background about uh, uh, Catherine Horikos Koopmans. So the speaker, the speaker series is supported by the Catherine Horikos Koopmans lectureship. And this endowment was established to honor the memory of Kathy Porikos Koopmans. Uh, she was a researcher uh, and had an interest in the area of psychosocial oncology. Sadly, she died at a fairly young age from breast cancer. So her late husband, or I guess her husband, um, and her mother put together this endowment so that we could support uh, distinguished visiting speakers presenting a lecture on psychosocial oncology every couple of years. And so I managed that through the division of psychosocial oncology at the School of Medicine. We're very pleased today to have the culminating lecture of the uh, 2021 lecture series. So we're going to start with Barry Baltz from the Planning Committee, who will introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Nadine Karan. Following that, we'll have a panel discussion, which will be uh, moderated by Arrow Big Smoke. And these are the uh, participants in the panel discussion, whom Barry will also introduce. And then we'll finish with audience Q&A. I want to just acknowledge the planning committee who's worked very hard to pull this all together over the last few months. Uh, so big thank yous go to Angeline Latender, Arrow Big Smoke, Barry Baltz, Deborah Allett, Daniel Petricone, Westwood. All right, so now we will turn it over to Barry. Hi, everybody. I'm privileged and honored to welcome Dr. Nadine Caron to our Coupons Lecture Series. As well as being a star basketball player, while doing her undergraduate degree in kinesiology at Simon Fraser University, Nadine Caron was the first female First Nation student to graduate from the University of British Columbia Faculty of Medicine. She completed her postdoctorate uh, plus graduate fellowship and training in endocrine uh, surgical oncology at the University of California, San Francisco, and then went on to complete a master's in public health from Harvard University. Dr. Caron is an associate professor in the Department of Surgery at UBC Faculty of Medicine. She is co-director of UBC Center of Excellence in Indigenous Health. Dr. Caron is also an associate faculty member at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health in Baltimore, Maryland at the, in the United States. Most recently, in January 2020, Dr. Caron uh, was named the founding chair of the First Nations Health Authority in Cancer and Wellness at UBC. This new position was created to improve cancer outcomes and wellness among Indigenous peoples by examining the stories and needs of Indigenous cancer patients and their families. A little bit of background, Dr. Caron has received numerous awards. I'm not gonna go through all of them, but I will just highlight a couple. She was the top undergraduate student at Simon Fraser University in 1993. Uh, she was also the top graduating student in the Faculty of Medicine uh, and had the highest cumulative record of all years of study in her medical school's training. Now, in the popular press, Dr. Caron has been well recognized as well. McLean's magazine in 1997 said that she was one of the 100 Canadians to watch. Chatelaine magazine in 2016 described Nadine as a woman of the year. She was one of 12 individuals that the Chatelaine magazine said really rocked. 
Uh, she, at this point in time, has received two honorary doctorate degrees, doctorate of laws from the University of Simon, uh, Simon Fraser Valley, or Fraser Valley, and an honorary doctor of science from Simon Fraser University in 2019. Nadine has many firsts, but if you watch her TED Talks of 2017, you will see that Nadine's real mission real mission in life is to be a mentor, an educator, a patient advocate, a community leader, creating a path for all of us. It's great to have you here, Nadine, and we look forward, and all of us look forward to hearing from you. And thanks for joining us. Thank you so much, Barry. Can everyone see my screens okay? Wonderful. All right. So thank you so much to, uh, to Barry for that wonderful welcome to the organizing committee for inviting me to be here, uh, to the panelists, colleagues, and friends who I get to see this morning. Uh, very exciting. Uh, and to the audience uh, for joining by Zoom, uh, either in Alberta, across the country, and globally. Uh, I myself am speaking this morning from the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Klele Tene peoples also known by our colonial name, uh, name uh, Prince George, which is up in Northern British Columbia. Now, I am actually quite humbled to speak to this audience today uh, at the Koopman's uh, lecture series. Uh, when I was first asked, um, I have to say, you know, while I am in the area of cancer care and research, I thought at first as a surgeon, I'm quite a distance away from the psychosocial element of cancer care and research. Uh, so I was a bit intimidated and uh, met with Angeline, who I can never say no to, uh, and then met with Barry and the rest of the organizing committee and uh, was quite intrigued by what the Koopman's lecture stood for. And then I thought, you know what, I don't know if I really am maybe that distanced from psychosocial care, um, but the audience right now might be panicking a bit. I mean, a surgeon, some of my cancer care, my patients actually asleep in the operating room. Um, some people have been to those long winded uh, meetings we have, uh, especially prior to COVID when we're going through grants at odd hours of the evening and night, and then people falling asleep right in front of me while we're trying to work on the research part of things. And so I'm thinking, what part uh, uh, do I play? And then as I was getting ready and trying to focus on what can I talk about in this, in this place of honor uh, of doing the keynote address, and I thought about the power of a question. Uh, and I thought about it a lot because I tend to ask a lot of questions. So basically the power of the question, I thought, well, you know what, each clinical interaction, whether you're a physician or allied healthcare professional, otherwise it starts with history. And where you start your history sets, sets the stage for the story that you're going to, to get, the story you're gonna be honored with sharing uh, with, your, with your patient her story or his story. And it's really important because the, that is the power of the question. It gives us the story, but we need to tread carefully. And I unfortunately missed uh, Leah's presentation, but Leah did teach me one thing when she so eloquently stated at one point that we must tread carefully. Uh, and I think, uh, and Leah taught me that we must tread carefully across the entire cancer journey, including what, what questions we decide to ask. And I think that's the part where we can really uh, move with our patients to discover what their story is and what part that plays in the clinical realm. So I thought, well, you know what, let's dive into this. Stories are powerful teachers. Sometimes in the academic space, we call them cases because it makes us sound smarter, but make no mistake about it. I think Thomas King, one of my favorite indigenous authors said it beautifully when he said, the truth about stories is that that is all we are. And so I thought I would share with you some stories uh, early on in my career because I realized quickly that my patients across my entire clinical uh, uh, career were going to be my greatest, uh, my greatest teachers. So I wanna talk about my first patient. And I'm going to ask in the chat if the chat, actually, I can't bring up the chat. So Barry, I'm going to put you on the spot. I have a patient who uh, is a First Nations female. Can you give me a name for her? Uh, Joan. Joan. Okay. So Joan, um, 
I get a phone call from Joan's family physician on a Friday evening, and he's a bit concerned because Joan has presented with a palpable breast mass, and she's quite concerned. She's in a remote res outside of Prince George, about a four to five hour drive, and uh, he really is hoping that I can see her on an expedited basis. But this is Friday afternoon, and so we start doing the scramble of phone calls between the band office and his office and my office. And over a period of a few phone calls, we're able to arrange a consult the following Monday, which is about three days later. And so we have it all arranged, and the Monday consult comes, and I'm waiting for Joan to show up, and she doesn't show up. So my office calls uh, her at home, and she's at home. What happened was the individual that was going to drive Joan into Prince George in that four or five hour drive didn't show up. So she had no way to get there. Now you could say, what about public transit? Well, she was about an hour drive at least off of the highway from the nearest Greyhound bus station. So the public transport was not even an option for her. So we arranged for her with a few more phone calls to come in on Tuesday. So this was great. No, not much of a delay. Tuesday consult came and went. No Joan. So we called her again, but this time the phone was disconnected. It turned out it was at the very end of the month. And so now it was the beginning of the month and her phone was disconnected. There were financial issues that in impeded her ability to pay her bill. She didn't have a cell phone, not only for financial reasons, but she was in a remote village and the cell phone coverage in that village was horrible. So there's no point even having a cell phone. So we called the band office and the band sent someone by foot over to Joan's house and they found both Joan and the individual who was supposed to drive her sitting at Joan's house. Now he showed up this time, but this time on foot because the car he was going to use didn't, wasn't working and didn't start. And so they were scrambling trying to find another car that they could use to come into Prince George. There are very few on the res that they could borrow and all of them were being used or couldn't be given up for the length of time that was needed. Remember, four or five hour drive into Prince George, four or five hour drive back to the community, plus the time that she would be spending at my office and people couldn't afford to give the car up for the day. So we arranged eventually for a consult on Wednesday. So guess what happened on Wednesday? Wednesday, Joan's consult time came and she was there. In fact, she was there 20 minutes early because Joan had a concerning breast mass. She was scared, she was anxious, she was a bit subdued, she was worried. She showed 20 minutes early because she really wanted to know what the heck this was. So I did the consult, did the history and started to ask some questions, the physical exam. And pretty quickly, I started to share both Joan's concerns and her family physician's concerns that this was indeed worrisome despite the fact that she was 36 years old. So with some phone calls, we started to make some plans because I realized that with the challenges that Joan had had coming in on Monday and Tuesday and ultimately arriving on Wednesday, that for her to have to come back for any further investigations, blood, blood work, C, uh, mammogram, ultrasound, biopsies, repeat consult or follow-up visit, it was gonna be exceptionally difficult for her for very valid reasons. So made some phone calls, did some scrambling, we got bilateral mammogram arranged, a mammogram targeted to the side where the breast mass was, a breast ultrasound, a coordinated biopsy because the radiologist read the mammogram and ultrasound immediately. And all of that was arranged. Now this required a few phone calls uh, from my office, from me to the physicians, asking them to please, please, please somehow fit them into her schedule today. I explained the distance she had to travel, the challenges she had to coming into Prince George, uh, and the concern I had from a physical point of view in terms of what the mass felt like and her clinical scenario. I felt like I was using up currency, asking personal favors uh, to my colleagues. Can you please do this for me? And I think we've all felt that in some way, shape, or form, where we feel like we're using up favors for the month as we ask for someone to step in and help in the role of advocacy for our patients. But they were able to arrange this. And so all of a sudden, I explained what we needed to do, what I recommended. Joan certainly wanted this done, and off she went to the hospital. But there are elements to her story. So her ride couldn't stay. So he had a job and in Northern British Columbia, some of these jobs, either you don't get paid if you miss it and he needed the income or even the job security itself is at risk if you aren't able to make it. So her ride couldn't stay, he had to go back to the res. So we called the band office and her sister who lived on the res and we actually found a solution. So follow this. 
Joan would go and she'd get the investigations and she'd get the biopsy. And then she would take the Greyhound bus that would take her close to her community, but not to her community. And then the band arranged for someone from the band office to pick her up when the bus would arrive and bring her back to her sisters and her sister was on the res. Her sister was looking after her kids at the time who were two and five years of age and her sisters could stay until the bus was due to arrive. And then she had to go to her work which, which was the overnight shift at a motel on the highway. And equally, she could not afford to miss this, uh, this shift. And so everything went according to plan. Joan got the biopsy, everything was working. It was, it was exciting. There was a real team effort and, and Joan was certainly pleased that she was gonna start to get some answers. She missed the bus. So as things happen in hospitals, things got delayed and she was being added on at the end of the slate. And so she ended up missing the bus that would take her back closer to her community and all the plans fell through. But we weren't gonna give up. So my office and the band office scrambled and another band office actually in Prince George assisted with this and we got a hotel voucher for the evening. We got her dinner voucher, breakfast voucher. We were even able to work with Greyhound to change her bus ticket from that evening to the next morning with no uh, penalty. All was good, but she left. So we went to tell Joan this excellent news. Hadn't we done a good job and we couldn't find her. So we paged her overhead at the hospital and she didn't come back to the, the breast imaging unit. Uh, we, the security looked for her outside to see if maybe she had gone to just get some fresh air, but we couldn't find her anywhere. The ultrasound tech that was involved in her uh, biopsy helping the radiologist said that Joan had mentioned something about hitchhiking back to the res. She was absolutely panicked that she had missed the, the, the uh, bus back home. She had said something briefly to the ultrasound tech about her ex-husband and domestic safety issues. She had not disclosed this to her sister. She was worried that her sister would bring her kids back to her ex-husband's place, not aware of the danger that would put her kids in. So all of a sudden now, Joan was on Highway 16 in British Columbia, I would say very well known as the Highway of Tears, but I think across the country, very well known as the Highway of Tears because of the number of missing and murdered uh, women that were last seen hitchhiking on this long stretch of remote highway in northern BC, most of them Indigenous. Add that Joan was doing this in the winter. So although it wasn't that late, it was dark, it was minus 20, and we had now a single mother desperate to get home for the safety of her kids. It would do anything to get there. So I called the RCMP because Joan didn't realize that we had this thing set up and how could we protect her children before she could, would get back because it sounded like now it, she was at danger of not getting back to the community, even if she tried. So I called the RCMP and I explained the clinical or the, the scenario in terms of Joan hitchhiking and why we needed to help her out. And the response was that nothing had happened yet. And so there was nothing they could do. So then I called Doug and I don't expect anyone in the audience to know Doug, but everyone in Prince George people knew Doug. So Doug used to be with the RCMP. And for those not in Canada, it's basically the police uh, that's sort of diffusely located across uh, the country and in Northern BC is our police force. Doug had we used to be high up in the RCMP in the North, but he subsequently moved down South, but he still knew uh, his colleagues up in the North. So I called Doug, I explained to him what was happening he got on the phone and in his internal little world, he could make the RCMP understand what I was worried about. They went out to Highway 16. They explained to Joan when they found her what we, what we were concerned about. And then Joan explained what she was concerned about. They worked with Joan to get someone in the, her community to pick up the kids, to bring them to her friend's house who lived off the reserve, who would then uh, pick up Joan at the Greyhound bus station and then bring her and her kids safely to her house. We did it. Joan came in, she got the biopsy. She was gonna go stay overnight in the hotel. She had food, she had transportation, her kids were safe. What do you think the biopsy showed? Interestingly enough, I, I've told this story before and it's obviously uh, an iteration of uh, a true story but not uh, to the details that you would uh, be able to identify the patient, uh, the, the real Joan. But you know what, I don't tell what the biopsy showed. Because essentially, let's take a step back for a second. This, I know, is a pretty common picture. And sometimes we show it with a tree. Sometimes we show it with a baseball field. But let's say the healthcare system or the cancer care system is the baseball game. And everyone's there because they want to see the baseball game. 
They need to see the baseball game. It's their favorite team. Well, basically, we know that we make a mistake when we treat all people equal, because then all of a sudden, if people aren't starting at the same place and we give everyone the same thing, then they're not going to have access to the same healthcare system. So what we need to do in order to ensure that everyone has access to that cancer care system is we need to adjust things in terms of providing everybody with what they need to get what uh, to get access to that healthcare system. That's the element of equity. And so in this case, when we're looking at this, elements of Joan's story really barred the boxes on the far right so that she could actually get to Prince George. She could get to the hospital and she could get home safely. But there's something about this picture that doesn't fit to me. And so I think we need to take a look in Canada and start to really take a look at the far right and realize we have what we think we have in equity and what we really have. And we know that we have people who have like the penthouse view of our healthcare system. They have above and beyond. They get like the best seat in the house. And quite honestly, they don't even usually need the best seat in the house because the baseball game isn't even the game they wanna see because they have, they don't get the health comorbidities and the health risks that someone down maybe in the middle per, per, uh, area does. I think the middle person with the box in the red shirt, I think that's you know what we're aiming for in terms of that's what we think an average Canadian has. But then we sometimes have to look at reality. And we do have populations that when we look at it, no matter how hard we try, we can try to provide the boxes, but sometimes we're providing the boxes and really what we're ending up showing is that there's this fence. The boxes show someone that there's a fence and it's even unanticipated barriers to the healthcare system that we really need to start to address. So when we look at pieces of the puzzle and I'm thinking, hmm, you know, sort of the psychosocial cancer care and me as a surgeon, what about the social determinants of health? What about that that's upstream from the healthcare system? What is my role as a surgeon in this space? I know, I mean, I, I think we understand the conventional determinants of health. It's employment and poverty, social support network environment, safe housing, safe living conditions in general with respect to uh, domestic violence, safe drinking water, all of that. And we saw some of this come out, transportation, access in that way for Joan. But as Malcolm King, a colleague of ours, uh, eloquently put it with his colleagues in, in the Lancet article, there are also indigenous specific determinants of health that I think we also need to recognize. There's the, the, the colonization history of our country, the legacy of Indian residential schools, assimilation policies of our federal government that, that have impacted the healthcare system that we try to make work, and the social determinants of health upstream. There's a, the element of cultural uh, culture and ceremony that the legacy of Indian residential schools tried to pull down, and that our self-determination and, our, and the resilience of our peoples, our first peoples in Canada are revitalizing and saving and nurturing. And, I, and, and people like Angeline and Leah Bill are so critical in that space uh, and language and self-determination. Determinants of health are such a critical part of all of this. So that's Joan. Joan, I think, we need to really look, I need to look at the social determinants of health. I need to look upstream. I needed to look beyond the healthcare system in order to be able to help her as a surgeon. So let me tell you about another breast cancer referral. So Barry, I'm gonna put you on the spot again. You gave me Joan, what's another name I can use? Is this a male or female? I'm sorry. Uh, uh, female. Female. Um, Bonnie. Bonnie, okay. So Bonnie, so Bonnie, is a 62-year-old First Nations woman that's living with her granddaughter for the winter in Prince George. She was originally from a reserve that was just uh, like a few hours outside of Prince George, but her granddaughter's lived in Prince George for years and she's really enjoying living uh, with her. Then while she was living in Prince George, she noticed a mass in her right breast. So she went to a walk-in clinic and she, the walk-in clinic doc said, yeah, you know, I can feel what you're talking about. You know, I'm not sure what it is, but let's start with, the, you know, the basics in terms of let's get you a mammogram and an ultrasound. And because the, they could feel the mass, they walk in clinic or uh, refer her to a general surgeon in town. So Bonnie basically saw the general surgeon, got the mammogram, got the ultrasound, and the general surgeon referred her for an ultrasound guided needle biopsy of the mass to find out definitively what this is. 
So for reasons we didn't realize at the time, she missed the appointment at the hospital for the biopsy. And, um, and so she did something reasonable. She called her general surgeon's office to get help rebooking it, which is the protocols that in the hospital you need to do here in Prince George at the time. And so when she called the general surgeon's office, the response from the medical office assistant or the secretary was that she had missed her chance. She had a biopsy appointment, she missed it. And so she needed to get re-referred to a different surgeon because they were just way too busy to deal with people that missed their chances and that she should have known better. Um, so Bonnie, you know, she was reasonable. Um, she was upset, but she went back to the walk-in clinic, you know, and said, you know, here's the situation. I missed my biopsy. And now the general surgeon said, I'll have to get another referral. But they kept going back to her records and they said, well, you know, you came here, we referred you to Dr. X, so you should go back there. So she would go back to Dr. X and she would call and she would say, I was told by the walk-in clinic that I need to come back here. And she was told basically, go back to the walk-in clinic, find another referral. So she went back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And then ultimately she decided to go to the Central Tier Native Health Clinic, which is in downtown Prince George, which predominantly serves indigenous peoples, but not solely. Um, and it's where her granddaughter went uh, for her health care. And so she ultimately just went in and walked in the door and said, I need help. You know, it's been two, two and a half months and I just can't get anybody to help me. So they, started with a history, did a physical, and quite a way shared her concern and ordered an urgent breast biopsy. Her mammogram showed a BIRADS 5 lesion, which basically to put it in like language that is understandable, it means basically cancer until proven otherwise. So they arranged for this urgent breast biopsy to be done and not unexpectedly, it came back as invasive breast cancer and the tumor now was 3.2 centimeters. So then she was referred to me. And this was with a phone call by doc, from Dr. Smith. And Dr. Smith called me because she didn't want to wait for the, the paperwork to go through. She wanted me to see her on an urgent basis. So let me give you some background to Bonnie's story. So her trust in the healthcare system was limited to begin with. The Dr. Smith was starting to sort of get into the, uh, the background about this and it became evident to, uh, to me as well. Um, so, but Dr. Smith said, can you see her here? Like she seems most comfortable here. Her granddaughter knows here and she really doesn't want to go to another clinic. And so I arranged to see her there. It actually worked out because now COVID had started. So she fell into that COVID sort of chasm where things really halted. And although she had presented a couple of months before COVID started, now COVID had started. I had no access to PPE at my office and the ambulatory care unit at the hospital in Prince George was completely shut down as they revamped it to make it fit pro COVID protocols. So I saw her later at the week, in the week at Central Tier Native Health with her granddaughter. And then the question started. And I started to understand a little bit more. She was an Indian residential school survivor. Her parents had experiences in the Indian hospitals and the history there. And she shared a little bit about personal experiences in particular that she had faced with respect to racism and discrimination or stereotyping in the healthcare system. And she, especially over the last two months, really was not in a safe space. She kept mentioning as we were moving on about pain in her breast and I was expecting, you know, this is not unusual. She had had the breast biopsy very recently. It can cause bruising. It can even cause a hematoma or blood collection deep in the breast that can even be invisible to, you know, to, to the site, but it can cause a lot of pain and discomfort. But she was really fixated on the pain in her breast that she'd been telling the walk-in clinic docs and the, the uh, office at the, the surgeon she was originally referred to. Um, I didn't make much of it at the time because nothing had been mentioned to me until I did the physical exam. At this point now, when I did the physical exam, it was imminent. Like it was, she had a fungating breast tumor that was visible from across the room. Remember, she started with, um, she could feel a mass and the, the doctor kind of agreed they felt one, but they needed a mammogram to confirm. And now it was to this point, two and a half months later. So she, in her best interest, based on guidelines, she would be a great candidate for neoadjuvant chemotherapy or going to have chemotherapy first before even surgery because of the cancer progressing so quickly. But she did not want to have the chemotherapy. 
After her visit to the cancer agency, she did not want the chemotherapy. But then when she came back to see me, I explained that this was really what we thought would be in her best interest based on the guidelines for the type of cancer and the, the rapid progression of her cancer. So then she said, okay. Then she went to the cancer agency. There was something about it that just wasn't working. So she declined it again. But then later she changed her mind and she decided to do this. She was really tormented like internally uh, in terms of what, where she felt safest, what she was trusting, what she believed in, what she wanted. This, this was a significant uh, progression that she was going through. Um, the chemotherapy was started, but she was missing her appointments. She'd go, she'd make one and then another, and then she'd miss a couple. And then ultimately we agreed when I met with her that perhaps it was her best option to proceed with surgery. And I underline her because I think it's really important to recognize that even though textbooks or guidelines or the internet says that she should not be having surgery with a fun gaining mass it really given her age and her and her status otherwise she should be having chemotherapy for her it wasn't working we needed to do what was best for her so with the input from the cancer team from her from her granddaughter and uh and myself she went on to proceed with the mastectomy and the sentinel lymph node biopsy she did actually really well she then decided that she would do the chemotherapy and to this day is actually doing well so where's the piece of the puzzle there? So there are obviously determinants of health upstream. I mean, we are talking about some of these things for Bonnie, a lot of them indigenous specific determinants of health that were just really causing internal turmoil in terms of her access and utilization and trust in the healthcare system. But let's make no mistake about it. The healthcare system failed miserably, miserably in terms of access to the care that she deserved in Canada, uh, anywhere, that in terms of her presentation and what she needed to have done. Universal healthcare system, that's what we say in Canada. We're actually proud of it. We say, you know, there's been surveys that have been done saying it's like the, the thing that most Canadians, the thing that Canadians are most proud of, uh, who's the most like, Influential Canadian, of course, in that survey, it was Tommy Douglas who started Universal Healthcare in Saskatchewan. And like, Universal, what do you think? Remember, Bonnie had no primary healthcare provider. She was living for months in, uh, in Prince George. Now, the screening mammogram program requires a primary care provider and a fixed address. I didn't go into it, but Bonnie was in and out of a fixed address during her attempts at chemotherapy. So she presented with a palpable breast mass. This was not screen detected. She had the courage, like the absolute courage multiple times to seek out medical advice and care and assistance and compassion at a walk-in clinic and surgeon and didn't receive it. At first she was met with a door that was propped almost open, but almost teasingly because then it became a revolving door that at first, yeah, I mean, even little kids, the revolving door is fun until they get spit out and injured and crushed. She was in a revolving door. And then her experience and memories of the healthcare system reinforced what? Going back to those indigenous specific determinants of health, her experiences of Indian residential school, we started to realize were quite triggered by her experiences in the healthcare system that we, that we say is so universal. And part of this is the unintended consequences. So remember, she was now caught in a healthcare system under the pandemic of COVID. And I say that while we put on our masks in COVID, COVID-19, I think we're realizing really has unmasked the cracks in our healthcare system. And we've heard about the statistics specifically with cancer, delays and cancellations of operations and delays and cancellations even in cancer screening and the impact that is going to have currently with people who remain undiagnosed, currently with people who are presenting at a later stage, currently with people who are having delayed care, but I don't think we're even seeing the results of people who are walking around with malignancies right now because they don't even know that they have it. And we've heard stories, there's the anxiety, and this makes sense, being alone in a hospital, because your loved ones can't accompany you to the test, you're waiting in, in, a, in a waiting room for a procedure that's going to be scary, the procedure itself, the results might be even scarier, and you're there by yourself. And then you go and you have an operation and you're sitting or lying in a hospital bed recovering from an operation and you can't even have visitors visit you in the hospital ward. There's the fears that you're going to a place where sick people go and you're going to be exposed to this hidden virus and the risk of that. 
And they're scared because some individuals were scared because they would be treated differently because of the risk profile that would they would be at higher risk for COVID because they weren't intelligent enough to actually adhere to the public health recommendations. And so would they be believed that they, that they were asymptomatic or would the surgery be canceled? So think of all of this. These are the unintended consequences of public health measures that were done and imposed to save our society from the COVID pandemic that is based in science, Western science. It's scary, isn't it? This is a picture of my mom's residential school. You know, Bonnie went to a residential school. For many indigenous peoples and communities in Canada, the, this isn't new, this fear. Sanitize, isolate, quarantine, government rules. It's in your best interest. These are words, these are phrases that you put government institutions together with words like this and all of a sudden it's making their baseline perceptions of hospitals healthcare providers and government institutions even worse don't forget indian residential schools tb sanatoriums indian hospitals today's versions trigger yesterday's memories and in bonnie's case that's where she was at i think in the past year the necessity for cultural safety and humility training and enforcement in our healthcare system has been highlighted even more. So in British Columbia, this is evident certainly, but across the country, I mean, Joyce Eshaquan's inquiry has just started yesterday. And I think indigenous peoples are really sitting with bated breath in terms of how that's going to progress and the outcome of that. In British Columbia, we had an inquiry last year and this report was released in November, 2020 called In Plain Sight that was addressing indigenous specific racism and discrimination in our healthcare system. And this element of it is really um, the, part, the third partner in the triad of crises, the COVID pandemic, the opioid crisis, which basically has, in, has certainly targeted indigenous peoples significantly more than the rest of British Columbia, and then racism in the healthcare system. Breast cancer referral number three. All right, very last one. We've got Joan, we've got Bonnie. How about Lisa? Lisa, okay. So this is a 58 year old First Nations woman that was referred for an abnormal screening mammogram. Her family physician called me and told me about the abnormal screening mammogram. She had already arranged the mammogram and the ultrasound which showed a persistent abnormality, although subtle, a stereotactic or a mammogram guided biopsy was done later that same week. It was positive for invasive ductal carcinoma. So she had breast cancer. Um, I saw the patient the following week. She came in with her husband and a friend um, and I agreed with the family physician. I didn't feel anything on physical exam. She was otherwise healthy. She had no comorbidities in terms of other health risks. Um, and so I did the consult, got her history did the physical exam and ordered some follow-up tests. Turned out that all her blood work was normal. Her imaging tests to look for metastatic disease was completely negative. Um, after discussing with her what her options were, she elected to pursue breast conserving surgery with radiation and a sentinel lymph node biopsy. So she had her surgery. She was just charged home the same day. She lived really nearby Prince George with her husband and her two children. Uh, she went on to have the radiation, which is the plan uh, with respect to the breast conserving surgery. Her sentinel lymph nodes were negative, so she didn't require any chemotherapy. And seven years later, she's doing well. Lisa, what's missing in this story? Well, what's the catch? Wouldn't it be great if there was none? But interestingly enough, I tell you that she's a First Nations woman, and all of a sudden we're wondering what's what's going on, what's the catch. But I think everybody here, especially in this space, when you're in the in can, psychosocial cancer care, psychosocial cancer research, the cancer journey is challenging enough. There doesn't have to be a catch. There has to, doesn't have to be some disparity. There doesn't have to be some egregious history of domestic violence or, re, or refusal to see or being kicked out of a, a clinic. There, there doesn't need to be anything like that. She's on a cancer journey. One day she was walking along and had no comorbidities, no concerns. And the next day she's being called back because an abnormal screening mammogram because she's proactive and very health conscious. And the next day she's telling, being told that the biopsy is positive. These are 
questions that sometimes have no answers. There's a fear of the outcomes, the side effects of the treatment, the complications that might happen, the complications that do happen. What's a piece of the puzzle? A piece of the puzzle is, as a surgical oncologist, it's cancer. As a psychosocial, uh, someone that provides psychosocial cancer care, it's the cancer journey. In research, when you're asked to justify your question, this is what I find fascinating. And this is why I say, what's the catch? One time I was really excited. I was on this teleconference call and I was looking at all good, like looking at the, the um, a project that would look at the capacity to implement the application of oncogenomics. So let's just say I wanted indigenous peoples in my communities that I got to work with that shared their stories with me. I wanted the Jones and the Bonnies and the Lisas. I wanted them to have a choice to be part of this like uh, precision medicine, this uh, the ability to do sequ genome sequencing of their tumor. I wanted them to be able to say, yes, they wanted to do that. And I wanted them to be able to say, no, they don't have to do that. And I was explaining this and this idea for a grant that was going to cost a lot of money. And there was someone on the end of this teleconference call that I didn't know that was there listening. It was There was about 20 people on the call. And there was this question that came out. And this individual was just puzzled. And I honestly, to this day, think they were really trying to help me out. They were really trying to like save me some time. And they said, you know what? You know, Dr. Cron, I can see your reasoning here. I can see this is a very interesting uh, research question. Um, but uh, yeah, hmm, your people are really, you're killing yourselves. This was someone from a, another country. He says, aren't the suicide rates of in, like indigenous peoples in Canada really high? You know, don't you have like really high rates of diabetes? You know what? I, I've heard that trauma is like a major, major issue. Like you're not going to save people, you know, in genomics, in, in trauma. You're, you know, I, I don't think that there's going to be much application there. All of a sudden, I had to justify this question yet. When it comes in the world of cancer, if you're to walk through the door and you weren't identified as an Indigenous person in Canada and you had a tumor at a cancer agency, this is starting to become more and more a standard of care and at least to look into the potential options for research studies out there. So what is our role as cancer researchers? I think it, it's all part of it. I can't, as a surgeon, like extrapolate myself from the social determinants of health. I mean, I guess I could, but it all starts with where the question is. Like, let's look at Joan. Like, really, I could have just started talking to Joan and ask her, when did she notice a mass? Does it hurt? Has she have, does she have a family history of breast cancer? I could have just looked at the pathology, read the mammogram, and then moved on with things and said, this is what I recommend. Tell me if you want the surgery. And off I went to another patient. I guess I didn't need to know. I didn't need to know that she lived on a res. I didn't need to know how far it was from town. I didn't need to know that she didn't have cell phone coverage or that she lost access to her phone or that she didn't have a car. I didn't need to know that she was a single mother. I didn't need to, like, I didn't need to know any of that. What about the healthcare system? When it came to Bonnie, did I need to know that she saw another surgeon? Did I need to know how many times she'd been to the walk-in clinic? Did I need to call the walk-in clinic physician and have an unpleasant conversation with them? You know, at what point, you know, is my role basically just to treat the cancer that is this fungating mass on our chest wall and say, hey, you know, see the cancer agency. This is past what a surgeon can do. What is my role just to cut out the tumor? I think I realized that when I was preparing for this talk that really it's all how much we want to dive into the story. How many questions we want to ask and the honor that our patients would trust us to answer the questions. There is so much power in a question. All healthcare starts with a question. All healthcare, even if you are a trauma surgeon and the patient comes in unconscious, you then turn and you ask the question to the ambulance driver. All health research starts with the question. Why do we do research? We do research to answer a question. But the caveat is, of course, is that we don't answer a question to do research. Be careful about that. It sounds very similar, but those are the requests for proposals that the granting agencies have, like the research granting agencies that say, here's, you know, here's um, something that you can apply for. And then you try to fit 
you know, a question into it so you can apply for a grant. You know, of course, there's the, the R's of research, the respect, the relevance, the reciprocity, the responsibility. I'm not sure if you talked about that earlier on in, uh, in this lecture series, but you need respect for healthcare and for health research. It has to be relevant, the reciprocal and the responsibility. Of course, health research and healthcare has to have a benefit for the patient, for the research participant. But we have to be careful because as a healthcare provider and as a researcher, we're not allowed to interpret what the benefit is. We can guess, we can have our opinions, but the benefit really is left to the person who decides what do they want, what outcome is important to them, what do they need, who drives these decisions. I, I say to medical students all the time, do not lose the skill or the courage to ask a question. I say it to undergrad students and master students and PhD students, the courage to ask a question, regardless of the, where you are in your spectrum of training. I mean, kids are brilliant at this. You know, you have kids and they say, why is the sky blue? Why, when I drop something, does it fall to the ground every single time? They ask these brilliant questions. And then with time, I don't know if it's society as a whole, it just stops us from feeling comfortable asking a question. So what is our goal? It's not this. Equality sounds all fluffy and everything, but it's, we know that's not what it is. Equity is a great idea. We can't get there unless we face reality and realize well, some, we've got to like buffer up and realize where some people are starting. But is this our goal? Does there need to be a fence? You know, who asks these questions? Who gets to be at the table? Who are the leaders? You know, what are the questions going to be? And I think at this point, this is way in the future, but we have to have the courage to ask some really hard questions, really hard. Ones that don't have obvious answers because those are when you really have a question. Have the courage to ask a question even when the answer seems really out of our reach right now. I'll finish with a quote that I love. Questions you cannot answer are usually far better for you than answers you cannot question. Questions you cannot answer are usually far better for you than answers you cannot question. Thank you. Chi miigwech. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Karan. That was inspiring and just beautiful. I'm going to turn it over to Barry now to introduce the panel, and then we'll carry on the conversation.